ready as we're gonna be. You guys, you guys gotta do this too. Come on. Yeah, we're all in this together. All right. Ready? <laughs> Action! Action! Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of our Pro Plus Business Training Series webinar. My name is Christine Rich. I am the Res Repaid Marketing Director for Sherwin Williams, and with me is my fantastic co-host Julie Zamsky. Hi, everybody. Julie Zamsky here. I am the Commercial Marketing Director at Sherwin Williams. And we have our two guests today that you met earlier during the live um, portion of the webinar, Chris Moore and Shane Fast. So in interest of time, we're just going to hop right into uh, our questions for them all about job costing, which is probably one of the topics we hear most often um, from our pros. And so what better way than to just start jumping right in? Great. So Chris and Shane, we get this question all the time, and I'm sure you might as well. What is the best way to estimate a job? Shane, do you want me to go first? You know, yeah. that way I can get all the good answers out of the way and leave you with nothing. So you, you good at that? Uh, yeah, then I can just say, oh, I was going to say all that and then some. So you just go ahead. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, um, that's awesome. No, so Julie, I think the answer to your question, like, I don't really think there's a right or a wrong way to estimate a job. Um, I think, you know, there's a way that we kind of teach our clients to do it. Uh, but I think really at the end of the day, there's a hundred different ways you can get to your number. Um, but for me personally, it really makes sense to estimate it by the amount of hours it's going to going to take to do the tasks and the scope of work. Uh, I think that this is kind of the method we teach our clients is come up with the amount of hours, obviously material supplies and, you know, add on top of it to get to your final number. Um, but for me, the hourly method versus like the square foot method um, just makes a lot of sense. I think number one, it sets your production team up for success, right? Because then you can have the bid say, hey, okay, this job was 50 hours. Uh, if you take your notes like in the Google Sheet or something like that that we have that we utilize with our clients, you know, you can say, hey, they estimated eight hours for the bedroom, this for this, this for this. Like it really just sets your team up for success. And literally, it's just a handoff. Um, and I, I think the other thing, Christine, you just mentioned job costing a second ago, like being able to estimate it by the hours, it gives you that real time feedback when you job cost your projects after they're done. Because then you can say, okay, hey, we estimated 50 hours for it. And how, how long did it take us, right? If, if you came back in at 65 hours to complete the job and you estimated 50, like you kind of have that discussion with your team and say, hey, was this a production issue? Was this an estimating issue? Did I need to factor more time in for things? Like it just kind of gives you that real time feedback. Whereas I think doing it the square footage method, really you're just looking at your price, your numbers and your job costing when it comes down to it. So I, I like the hourly method uh, when it comes down to that. Yeah, I think that's all. Um, I mean, that makes sense. I think Chris is right. The biggest thing is everybody's going to do a little differently. Um, so I think doing it con consistently. So having, uh, and that's one thing he referred to as a production hour. So whether, you know, we do a lot of things by linear feet, counts, doors, windows, square footage, some things like that. Some of our stuff is more subjective um, in terms of like hours. Okay, we think it'll take this many hours to do this type of work. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just being consistent with what you're doing and also kind of backing up even before the technical aspects. It's, you know, how, how is that when that first call comes into your office or to your phone, if you, you know, um, if you're still answering all the calls, which is fine, because I've only stopped doing that last two months. So it takes years to get to that point. Um, you know, how is that first call received? How is the customer's experience in that? You know, how is that initial conversation? How, how are you prepared when you walk in the door that you have a pretty good feel for what they want? And then are you able to kind of hear, really hear what they're saying and really hear their needs? Because you want to present yourself as someone who's there to meet their need, right? Um, more than just sell them something. And so I think when you can combine a lot of those things as intangibles with what Chris is saying and have a process, then I think that really sets you up for success. Perfect. Okay, so... We've all learned lessons the hard way. So what are some common mistakes that maybe you've made or you've seen other folks make when it comes to estimating a job? And what are some tips and tricks you have to maybe avoid some of those common mistakes? Absolutely. Uh, Shane, do you want to go first this time? So that way I can just say what he said when you're done on this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he's saying that you have more mistakes. Is that what he's saying? <laughs> so I, think, I mean, uh, I might so. take that how you want. So, yeah, one of the best things I ever did, I it was probably like a fourteen or $15,000 interior job, and I forgot to include the paint. And so, oh. so yeah. Oh, no. 
and I was like sciencing everything out. And this was before. And again, this now this is a reason to use spreadsheets and other things because that doesn't happen anymore. Because I said, okay, we're gonna like, we're gonna, you know, it's not just gonna be like pen and paper, right? And um, so anyway, so uh, taking uh, detailed notes when you're on the when you're at the estimate, really hearing from everyone as they're sharing what they you know what their needs are, taking detailed notes. Hey, we're painting this room, but we're not painting this wall or the client doesn't want this thing done or whatever it might be. Or we have 10 doors and here's kind of where they are and then transferring that. So the other mistake I've made is having great notes and not putting them in the estimate. And then you get in this awkward conversation then where they signed a contract, but I didn't have that detail in there. I can go back and show them where I had the detail on the walkthrough initially. You know, that's awkward, right? So um, I will say when you make those mistakes, I found it better to just eat it. So I just ate the $1,500 in paint or whatever it was. I never told the customer that, um, even though I knew that the other estimate they had was higher. <laughs> and so um, it wasn't like, oh, well, this is why, you know, because then I just think that makes you look like a total idiot. And um, and so, I, and I just think it's, you're, you're playing the long game, right? Like you're not just trying to win on that job. You're trying to win the long-term relationship. So. If you do make a mistake, just make it right. If they think you're supposed to paint something and it's not that big a deal, take you a couple hours, just work it in and just figure it out, you know. But I think I think making sure materials accounted for, sometimes that's masking, sometimes that's caulk, that can be different things depending on what you're doing and that stuff can really get away from you. So if you're spraying a big exterior or something, there's a ton of masking and you don't think about it, all of a sudden you've dropped a couple hundred dollars on masking plastic or, plastic or something, right? Or you need to rent a lift and you know you need to rent it, but you don't calculate the actual cost into the job. Um, you know, it's it, that needs to be in there. Um, certain things like that, I think are very important um, to, to really make note of. Go ahead, Chris. Good. I, I was afraid you were going to just keep talking and you were going to take like all, all of my points here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest mistakes, definitely, you know, factoring your paint, factoring your labor, right? Double check that. Um, I, I just started laughing, Shane, when you started talking, because I knew that's exactly what you were going to say. And that's why we asked you to be on this webinar with us. Best you're story, transparent. It, it is. It really is. It's one of my favorites. Um, but, you know, I think a couple of things that we see a lot with our clients and, and, and talking to people, and obviously we, we go to speak for sure when all over the country. So we hear a lot of different feedback and things. But I think a couple of things, you know, Shane, you just mentioned it, not factoring in sundries, miscellaneous materials, things that, you know, go into your process of prep and, you know, protection of people's homes, right? If you paper all the floors, make sure you got a good cost factored in for that. Um, I think it's easy too, if you are, you know, maybe subbing out a small drywall repair, or there's something that you're, you know, having somebody else do, make sure you don't give the homeowner a price until like you have a bid from that person for that. I've seen a lot of people make that mistake. They're like, like we didn't really mess with drywall repairs because we, honestly, we just weren't that good at it. Um, and I had somebody local that loved doing small little repairs like that. So I just subbed it out to him and, and, you know, I would never just be like, oh, I think John's only going to charge us $300 for this. Like, I would literally talk to him and be like, hey, what's your cost going to be on it? Because sometimes if I would do that, like, I'd be like, oh, I didn't expect it to be 500 bucks. I'm glad I didn't just present this price to the homeowner. And now I got to eat a couple hundred bucks, right? Um, so I think if you're doing little things like that, make sure you get firm bids for it before you put it all together. Um, not accounting for sales tax on paint and products. I, that's one thing I love being able to look up paint prices and like the Pro Plus app and stuff here with Sherwin. Um, but make sure you remember their sales tax on top of those numbers, right? That's just the raw cost of what you're getting the materials for. Uh, so factor that into it. Uh, I love what Shane just said about taking notes at the estimate. Um, again, I think it sets your production team up for success. Um, we actually had kind of a checklist we went through at every estimate to make sure that we factored in all the little miscellaneous things, right? Um, thinking about problem areas, you know, potential areas that we're gonna, hey, we gotta get up on a roof and this is gonna be tricky. We, we need to factor in a little more time for this, or hey, everything we're doing is up on the second floor soffits and fascia. So we're gonna have a hundred ladder moves and a lot of time climbing up and down ladders to move things. Um, so we might need to factor in a little bit more time because most of our production rates were just kind of your normal, you know, production rates, right? Um, so when you're going into some extremes like that, you got to factor in extra time. Um, you know, additional equipment, like Shane said, if you need a lift, factoring in the exact cost of that, not a ballpark number you think they're going to charge you for it, and maybe add in a day or two in case it gets rained and you got to keep the lift an extra day or two, right? 
Um, just kind of thinking ahead on those things. You know, I always made sure that we had really good notes on this is the special equipment. Hey, we need a 32 foot ladder. We didn't take the 32 foot ladder to every job site we did because it was a pain in the butt and we used it, you know, twice a month. So, you know, making sure I had notes on when we needed special equipment that wasn't part of our day to day crew kit um, was really key. I think two other things we see a lot. Number one, just not having a consistent bid in like a number system to take your numbers, right? Your bid should be consistent. Um, you know, again, when you have a good system in place, you know, your bid for Mr. Smith on one side of town should be the same as, you know, Miss Jenny on the other side of town, right? Um, you shouldn't charge one 400 for a bedroom and one 600 for the exact same project, right? We want it should be consistent, should be duplicatable. Uh, and then I think another thing is not having a professional way to put an estimate together and present it to a homeowner and send it to them, right? Whether you're using the bid tool here at Sherwin, um, you know, a lot of other great platforms out there, um, make sure that you've got a good way to be professional looking, um, to make it easy for you and the customer. I think that's one thing we think about a lot. We only think about making it easy and streamlined and easy for us as the business owners, but we forget the the customer experience side of that, right? So make sure you've got a platform that seems to work well for both parties. I have a quick follow-up question. And Shane, we talked about this a little bit before, but I really liked what you said about helping to educate the homeowner on how you came up with your price. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that there is, um, you know, I think sometimes when folks are maybe just starting out, they feel a little bit nervous to ask what they're worth. And then mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Just that education piece? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a couple of factors that we try to emphasize. Um, and so some of this is kind of detailed, but you know, workers comp. So almost everybody carries general liability because that's not very expensive. You know, workers comp really gets costly and um, not many people carry that. So if you are really running a, a, a really legitimate, good, healthy business and you have that workers comp, then you need to tell people you have that, you know, and, um, you know, and I've, <laughs> I've, I actually, the, the best one I did recently, I had one of our team on a call with me and I was walking around and it was a ranch house, so it's not too tall. And I'm sorry, this is way too detailed for this webinar, but um, <laughs> it, yeah, I said, well, I know the other because she mentioned who else came out and I knew they didn't carry insurance. And I just said, you know, you probably that, that's not a very tall height. So if somebody falls off a liar there, it really won't be a big deal. And I was serious. Like I was really thinking, like, that's not that big a deal. You don't need to hire us. Just hire them. Just get it done cheaply. We have enough work. It's not a big deal. But her eyes got like that big. Um, you know, and so I really, I really was just verbally processing, which I'm notorious for doing. <laughs> And, um, but I thought, okay, we need to really be making sure we emphasize this on every job, not just the two story jobs. That's generally when I think of it, you know, um, or, Hey, it looks like somebody's going to spray your house. If they shoot something in their hand, you're going to be paying for their hospital bill, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, so workers comp is a big one. Um, I think that talking about, you know, um, the products, cause we typically quote on, uh, higher end Sherman products and like on our cabinets we're using certain wood coatings and other things um, that other people aren't typically going to use right and so how do we let them know that hey we're not bidding this on Promar 400 or even Promar 200 and I'm not against those things there's a place for some of those um, but we have gotten to where we love using scuff tough uh, for people with kids so children teenagers, they're going to beat up the walls, hey, for an extra $10 a gallon, which is only going to be $200 on this job, you can do this. And letting them know the value of that, educating them on sheen, um, you know, what on a two-story wall, hey, we can do it in flat and that's going to look the best, but here's how that's going to wear. If we go to an eggshell or satin, it's going to flash inevitably, like we cannot stop it from doing that. Um, and so just educating on what to expect in the end as well, right? So do you find that helps with some of that pushback when they're like, oh, you're not, you know, I have a quote that's much less. Has that, does that typically help? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, so when that happens with cabinets, I mean, if we're at 4,500 and somebody's at 1,400 and they just want like the cheapest thing, then you just move on, you know? Um, but, you know, I know we won one last week that I'm pretty sure we were on the upper end of, and I just ed educate them on the process on the outcome, what they can expect, how we do it, and um, even use names of team members. Hey, Tanya leads our cabinet refinishing process, you know, some of that kind of stuff. And I think that, um, I think that has definitely won some jobs, educating on that, and the workers' comp definitely has helped some too. 
So. I think one thing too, we always had put together, was like an estimate comparison thing we would leave them with afterwards that was like, hey, if you're getting other bids, make sure you're comparing them apples to apples, yeah. insurance, are they behind on their taxes? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, like what what product are they using? Is the scope of work the same, right? Because somebody yes. might have came in and bid you just for the walls and then I get there and I'm talking to you and I'm like, hey, like if you thought about painting your ceilings, because now would be a good time to do that before you do the walls. And then all of a sudden our bid is significantly more expensive because we're doing ceiling and walls versus just the walls, right? Um, you know, one coat versus two coats, product quality, right? You know, we use duration, um, super paint were the two that we use the most occasionally emerald. So, you know, I think just really making sure that, you know, we educate them, but Shane, I like what you do is, is weaving that into like your sales process and the mm -hmm. walkthrough with them, right? Like we would give them the piece of paper that they could reference back to, but we would cover a lot of that as we were kind of walking through the job and talking through things. And I think that's where it's a good thing to where you're not defensive about it. You're educating and being proactive with it. And then we're also just leaving that with them as kind of something to have to refer back to for the other bids they may get to kind of say, hey, let me double check everything, you know, apples to apples. Yeah, I was just gonna say our leave behind literally has a headline. You know, we have like four blocks and, and we have a picture of our team. So I think that's helpful. They can see people, but then it just says insurance versus risk. And really what it's saying is if you hire somebody without workers comp, you're taking the risk. And um, and I try to even explain why workers comp and gen like like only workers comp actually covers you as a homeowner and gives you a buffer, you know, and, and I'm sure and most I just, homeowners don't know that. Right. No, no, yeah. I don't think so. And so, you know, and I, I and I think I mean, I was a short, concise and chat GPT helped me get there. Um, <laughs> but if I'm honest, but, um, you know, it, it's we're trying to present that information, like Chris said, like in conversation, asking questions as you walk around is another way to educate them. Hey, have you thought about this or OK, I see this crack here. Let me explain to you why that happens and what we can do about it and stuff, stuff they might not even thought about dealing with, you know. Um, is important as well. So in my travels, I you know go to different markets, and I kind of want to piggyback off of something that Chris brought up earlier. He had said you had said, hey, you know, if you're bidding a bedroom at this house, you need to make sure your estimate is similar to the bedroom at the house, maybe two streets over, right? And you know you hear these rumors out there. It could be happening, but if a painting contractor or someone is too busy, they're going to bid one of the houses higher so that they don't get called back for the job. And I know a lot of our listeners may be in that situation. So how would you handle that? Do you just say, hey, listen, I'm very booked up. Like, how would you handle that so that you do keep it consistent? Yeah, I mean, I definitely like for us, we educate like kind of demand pricing to an extent, right? nothing that's going to be so crazy that it's going to put you in an awkward spot later on down the road right so i typically say like hey if you're booking out eight to ten weeks you know you can kind of afford to bump up that hourly rate maybe five dollars maybe ten dollars an hour right i'm not saying double the price anything crazy um but it's kind of one of those things that it you know go ahead and get it right or sometimes if somebody's like hey i need this done in two weeks and you're able to squeeze it in and you got to rearrange some stuff you should kind of make a little bit of a premium for the convenience you're giving them right but I don't think that it should be so astronomical that people are going to notice a huge difference, right? Like a three thousand dollar project in you know any normal time shouldn't become five or six thousand dollars, right? That three thousand dollar project should maybe become thirty seven hundred um, or somewhere in that ballpark, right? Um, so I think you can definitely, I don't want to say take advantage in a bad way, but I think you can definitely like utilize some of that demand pricing, like a lot of things are nowadays, right? Ubers that way, they're different Search companies pricing. like yeah exactly yeah search pricing like all across the map right yeah i'm not trying to talk about any specific companies but like just that's a thing all across the board so um you know i think that that's definitely something that you can utilize but i don't think again it should be so far out of whack that you're like hey we don't need this job we're just going to bid it at five grand and if they go with it go with it like i think that's kind of a bad business practice i think be realistic with them say hey we're booking out this far this is the value we have this is why people wait for us kind of like what shane was talking about and if it works for you, great. Um, and if it doesn't, like it doesn't, that's fine. But it shouldn't be at a price point that just is really, you know, astronomical. So we always like everyone to have some takeaway items from our, our training series. So what are three things that contractors can do today or start right now to help them estimate or job costs like a pro? That's good. Shane, can I take this one or? 
You got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll piggyback. Go. <laughs> That's good. Um, so I think a, a few things, one, a couple of these, maybe the kind of things we've already talked about. Number one, creating that estimating number system. I think that's a foundational piece to doing your estimates to make sure things are consistent, to take the guesswork out of it, right? I know some of you guys watching this have maybe been in business for 20 years, right? Like, you know, when you walk into a house that a, a $3,500 price tag on this is going to be a profitable job for you and your crew, but make it systematic. Like there shouldn't be guesswork. There shouldn't be room for error in there. Um, you know, again, kind of talking through some of those things we said, because I think a big thing is it, it becomes duplicatable, right? If you're planning on doing estimates every day for the rest of your life, well, then maybe it's not quite as important as long as you're profitable, right? But it, for those of you guys that are looking to grow, you want to teach somebody else how to do estimates, you have to have a way to teach them. You can't teach gut feelings, right? You can't teach 20 years of experience. So I think having a really good systematic, detailed number system, and it doesn't have to be It'll take time to get to and perfect it, but it's just start somewhere with it, right? Start tracking your production rates and how long it takes your painters to do certain tasks and be able to start using your estimates like that. Um, another thing we talk to a lot with our clients is create and, and look at what is the customer journey, as Shane mentioned, from the first time they reach out to you all the way through your sales process, right? Start looking at what are the things we can do to get better. You know, Shane talked about some of their lead behinds. I mentioned the one we had earlier. Um, you know, what can you do every step in the process to just make your sales process better and provide that value and that professionalism to maybe justify your price being above average if you kind of fall into that side of the market, right? Um, and so thinking through that, and then lastly, like I said, get the technology and the capability to do estimates on the spot. I'm a huge fan of doing estimates on the spot, not that I'm trying to hard sell somebody, but if you have the estimating number system together and you have some technology to put the bid together, there's really no reason why you can't present it to them on the spot. Um, and I really believe that you can go have a great conversation, build a great relationship with them. And then you send them the estimate later on that night, maybe even within four hours, but guess what? They're at dinner, they're at their kid's t-ball game when they get it, they look at it, they scroll down, they see the price and then they forget about it and they put it behind them. I think if you can kind of give them that experience all at one time, which is what they're calling you for anyways, right? Um, I think you can really just increase that relationship with them and probably increase your closing rate um, and just, you know, kind of knock it out then and there. And if nothing else, the nice thing is when you leave their driveway, there's no more added work you have to have to do that estimate, right? It's just following up with them within a few days. Yeah, I like that. I think that um, without giving, I mean, I can give more detail maybe in the live version about how we do that, to, that kind of Chris, like Chris said, from the first time it hits our website or a phone call, so we we finish. We have a lot of very systematic stuff, um, but I think you know. So it's knowing your numbers, setting all those numbers, defining a process, and doing the process. Um, and for us, that's about both about scaling, uh, quality of life for those who are actually doing it, and not creating as much headache for ourselves. So it's it, for us. It's how does our whole process give the customer that experience from the time we start the conversation about the possibly even looking at their house to the time we leave in the final walkthrough after we finish the job. And so this for us is a big part of that, whether it's clarity on the bid, whether it's, you know, the education, like all those facets are extremely important to creating that experience. Yep. yep. The before, during and after. I think that's great advice. And um, I'm sure we're going to have a ton of questions. So at this point, we're going to hop back over to the live portion of the webinar and we'll see you guys over there. Okay, everyone. So hopefully you enjoyed our conversation with Shane and Chris, both of who are here now. Technical difficulties hopefully are over. Thanks again for your patience. Um, there were some really great questions that came up throughout the chat. Um, but before we do that, we really didn't give Shane a chance to introduce himself. Um, so Shane, if you wanted to take a quick moment to tell everybody who you are, uh, what you do, and then we can start digging into some of the questions. Yeah, well, super quick. Um, thanks for having me here. We're in South Carolina. So I've been doing this here in South Carolina since late 2018, been in the industry since 2016 in a different location so we're, we're not a large large company we've got five full-time painters um but we're growing growing a lot and we're just uh, excited to keep learning with you guys excellent so uh julie do you want to start looking through some of the questions um maybe you find one i find one i know we've got a couple things happening but at this point um we've got a lot of folks on the call and yeah please don't be shy so you want to take the first one 
Yeah, so there's quite a few questions in here. There's a theme, right? There's a few themes that are in the questions, and one of them has to do with pricing per square foot, and that comes up quite a bit throughout the chat. And do you have any advice on pricing per square foot? Like, how does someone like kind of look at their market and kind of figure out that um, tips, tricks, something to that nature? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, we we typically try to teach more of the hourly method because, again, it sets your team up for production. You're able to analyze stuff a little bit better. Um, I do know there's, I mean, there's a lot of people out there, like I said earlier, I mean, you get to the number the same way, right? So, like, the method doesn't really matter, but it's a lot harder to really hone in on, like, what is that price per square foot? Are you doing price per square foot on the wall space, the ceiling space? Is it floor square footage, right? There's so many different ways to look at it um, that I think it's a little bit harder to get more consistent with, right? Um, and so, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of good resources out there as far as what you should be charging, um, what you could be charging, what your competitors are charging in your markets, right? So there's a lot of resources out there, both between what you guys have at Sherwin. Um, PCA obviously has a lot of great resources for some of that as well what the industry averages are in production rates and stuff. Uh, but those would be a couple of places that I would probably look at for that. Real quick, before we go into any more questions, um, if you don't know this, Sean Williams has um, a really incredible Pro Plus app. And in addition to all of the things you can do on the left-hand side, one of the um, tools in there is a project bids um, system. And so basically you can create a new bid and keep records of everything, access everything you need right from your Sherwin-Williams Pro Plus app. Um, all you need to do to sign up is download. You can use the QR code that you see here on screen to download the app. If you've got your Sherwin-Williams account number, your email address, and a recent receipt or invoice, um, just so we can validate the account, you should be ready to go with that. So this is just a really great tool that we wanted to quickly share as a resource um, that is value added for doing business with Sherwin Williams. So with that, I'm sure we've got some more questions, Julie. Saw something. Um, any specific tips for estimating jobs for a company who is a one-man band, no employees yet? So when I start out as a one man person, I, I mean, I really knew. Honestly, it sounds selfish, but it's like, what are you worth? Right. Like what what do I know I can produce and what am I worth and what I need to make? And just don't sell yourself short. I think a lot of times when you start out as an individual, you just you tend to sell yourself a little short of what you could make, you know, um, and and just because and a lot of times as individuals, we're probably faster than as we than when we build employees. So if I can paint a bedroom in two hours, that doesn't mean that bedroom's only worth you know two hundred dollars just because I can do it in two hours and don't say, well, I can make a hundred dollars an hour. You know, if I can paint in two hours, and it's worth three or four hundred dollars. That's what it's worth, you know. So I'm not saying I can't I'm just saying like hypothetically, you know, that's the tendency we have is to think what well, only takes me this much time. So I only charge them this much. So that's that to me is is a common thread I hear uh, I experience and I hear among people that are kind of one man crews. Julie, do you have any others that you're seeing in the in the chat? I know we've got lots. I'll get let you try the next one. Yeah, no, there's quite a bit in here. First, I just want to kind of address some of the questions that are coming through the chat about commercial estimating. And I just want um, the folks in the chat, like, please just clarify, because we are going to take this as information for a future webinar. Um, when we look at commercial, at least when I look at commercial, I think like warehouses or multifamily repaints, HOA repaints, um, large office buildings, inside and outside. Like there's so many pieces of commercial. And I know someone brought up epoxy floors. So please like just be specific there so that we can maybe address that on a future webinar. But that's not the focus of this one. So but we are happy to add that to our repertoire. Um, there were some more questions that came through just estimating interior versus exterior. Um, does your process change? Is there anything else that's unique to that when you're looking at exterior versus interior? Yeah, I mean, for me, the yes and no, obviously, they're completely different animals, right? But at the end of the day, and I didn't hear all of Chris's answer on the square foot because I got booted out and had to come back in. But, um, you know, we a lot of our stuff, we have kind of reverse engineered what we want our production hourly. What like what do we want to produce hourly and how long does it take us to do something? Um, and so we have linear feet prices on baseboard or crown, 
chair rail, uh, count prices on doors, windows, whether it's sash or, or just the casing. And so the same applies to the exterior. So if you're looking at stucco versus hardy versus brick versus, you know, there's, or, or hey, I'm just painting the soffit and fascia and gutters, you know, I'm not painting all the body. So I think it comes down to us. We've used the, the my Sherwin rep has been a great resource. He's been around for like 25 years. Uh, the PCA is a good resource. So we've pulled some different data pricings and then try to use those to figure out, hey, does this actually work? And sometimes we'll do a job and we're like, wait, our job costing is amazing. Was, was I just a little high and got lucky on this? Or did we just crush it? You know, we kind of evaluate that way. And sometimes it's the other way. And, and I look at it and say, I've got to, I've got to raise our rates there because I can see the team is, is working hard, but our numbers don't reflect that. So that means I sold it too low, you know, so job costing is a big way that we get to our numbers, big way. And I believe we've got, um, if you scroll all the way up to the top of this chat, um, I added some files in. There's a really great resource that Chris um, provided for everyone here today. It's basically an Excel worksheet that you can save to your computer and use to help with job costing. So if you scroll all the way up and don't see it, we will make sure that it gets linked in the show notes when we post this to YouTube as well. Um, We've got another question here. You guys mentioned eating costs on the job, um, but how do you go about making change orders slash price adjustment adjustments and going through the process with the client? Mr. Melanzo. Okay, so I, I think this is what he's asking. Uh, we have a situation right now where I just got a text from our production manager and they want us to, they said, hey, don't worry about the two-tone, don't worry about the chair rail, just paint it same color, same sheen, top to bottom. So. Our team rolls out scuff tough mat, top to bottom, paints the chairs, customer doesn't like it. So I price the job according to that specification. It takes a lot longer to cut around the chair rail because you're basically painting the wall twice, right? So then Tanya um, is trained on our team to go to the homeowner and say, hey, here's how we price this. There's gonna have to be an adjustment made. And if we know the adjustment, we can make it on the spot. If we wanna say, hey, we're just gonna keep up with, you know, we're, you know, it, sometimes it's a time of material adjustment. Hey, we didn't realize this spot in the drywall actually needed to be cut out, you know? Um, so for us, we either have a number to immediately communicate what that change is going to be, um, or if it's typically the more awkward ones are things that you couldn't have seen, right? Because they're thinking, oh, you should have known that. I'm like, I, I couldn't know that your 20 foot ceiling was actually like falling in before we got up there, you know? And so um, those, those they kind of can, the customer can get a little cranky about, but when they make a change, it's just, we make it clear, like, this is how we bid it. And that's why what you write needs to be very, very clear. So on that work order from today, if I held it up, it would say paint the chair rail through all the way through. It says all that detail, same sheen, everything. Um, so when they change it, we can say, hey, this is what we quoted on. This is how it's going to be different. So that's how we approach it. We try to you know, politely say, this is the data we had. So this was a situation, the situation has changed. So therefore the price has changed. So. Yeah. Is this any better, Christine? Oh, yeah. good. Yes. Good. Much better. Okay. Wow. I should have just done that hours ago. Um, I'll try to catch <laughs> up on a couple of things. No, Shane, you nailed it. Like I don't even need to be on here. Shane's just speaking everything I would have said anyway. So, um, you know, I think in that situation, I always tell the homeowner like, Hey, we're happy to do this but here's what it's going to end up taking to do this. Like we're more than happy to do it. You can now make a decision of, do you want to spend the extra money to do it? Or do you want to just live with what you had decided on initially? Right? Like we understand you have a budget, but also we have a budget too. Right? So um, right. we're happy to do it, but here's what it's going to take to do that. Um, I want to real quick piggyback on the last two questions for two seconds. Um, I think Shane, uh, what he said about the one man estimating thing is, you know, you can, you know, really essentially put yourself in a bind by not factoring in enough time to your estimate. So always do it at industry averages, what industry average production rates are, um, because I think that that's going to be a much better way to do it rather than how fast, like what Shane said, how fast he can do something. Um, and then as far as interior and exterior goes, I mean, we, we always have standards for each specific task on what you're doing on that estimate. And so really the estimating process, nothing changes. It's just obviously how you're coming up with your numbers because it's a little different to do interior versus exterior and how you're going to, you know, come up with your square feet per hour and that sort of stuff. But for the most part, the concept's the same. Julie, did you find any other questions? I've I found um, 
I found one that's actually kind of a segue that's going to one of our future webinars about hiring and recruiting and finding the right people and interview questions, which we are going to cover some of those topics in a future webinar. But Shane or Chris, do you have any advice on when you are recruiting employees, any interview tips, advice, anything like that? How much time do we have left? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think the biggest thing is have systems and structures in place for it. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is um, we forget as painting contractors or people in the industry that um, recruiting is actually a sales and marketing game, right? Mm -hmm. We think that it's a necessary means to an end and that we're going to just recruit people and they're going to disappoint us and it's going to be a headache and we just automatically like, that is the philosophy that most people in the industry have. It just is what it is, right? So I think we forget that it's actually a sales and marketing game to recruit employees, just like we recruit customers that need our services, right? Um, and I think just having some simple things in place to show that you are a professionalized company, that you are treating your business seriously like a business goes a long way with people, right? Mm -hmm. From an interview process to the way you write your job ads, to the first day on the job and what your onboarding process looks like, like you should have the right systems in place that sets that expectation. Otherwise people show up and they're like, this dude doesn't even take his business seriously. Why should I, right? So I think just really having some key things in place um, in those areas can be super helpful. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add to that is that it's a little uh, counterintuitive historically to say, oh, I'm gonna chase somebody. Uh, but we're in a market where good people already have good jobs. And so if we want to hire those good people and teach them the trade, or we want to, you know, pursue someone that maybe is at a company that's not treating them well, um, we're going to actually have to, our admin pursues our job leads just as we pursue sales leads. So uh, we're, we're, we're much more aggressive than we used to be. No, great advice. Thank you for touching on that. As I said before, this is a future webinar topic, so please be on the lookout for that. We have a whole hour dedicated to that. Shane, when we were um, talking through the uh, recording session, I know we kind of got cut out because we didn't have as much time, but you talked a little bit about how, um, you know, the way that your uh, folks even like on the phone will help to qualify before you even send somebody to the house. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, so there's two two different levels. I mean, kitchen. We do a lot of kitchen cabinets. We do about 30 or 40 kitchens a year, um, and we do them a little uniquely. So we charge more for them, right? And so we try to screen those really hard on the phone, so that we don't show up and give a $4,500 quote when they've gotten a $1,400 one. So on those, uh, Hannah, our admin, will get photographs and we'll kind of do our door drawer count. We'll call and do our spiel. Here's how we do it. Here's about what you're looking at. Is that within your budget? Do, your budget? Do you want us to come out? You know, so essentially, we're just trying not to waste my time and 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 just run around. So that's one layer we screen that way. The other way is we try to ask questions that let us know: Are you getting four bids for your project? You know, what's your determining factor? Um, you know, whether it's uh, timeline, you can kind of just start to get a sense of the person's uh, understanding of the industry and their expectations on the phone. Um, and I will say that even even if it's not a fit, you can still leave a really good impression through a conversation versus just taking that call and just scheduling an appointment right away. Uh, I think we've gotten a number of jobs because our admin is, is just willing to dialogue. Hey, can you send me a pictures, a couple of pictures of the project of, of certain areas that might be troublesome just so we can have an idea before you come out. And there starts this process to where they feel like they're already being cared for even before you set foot on the property to look at it. Um, so that's I, Chris, you might have some more screening questions, but those we don't have real nuanced, great ones, but we just try to get a gut sense of, you know, where are they in the process and, and are they just fishing for the lowest price? Because that's not going to be us. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, I mean, you know, relationship selling is really, I think, the best, most effective way, right? Building the relationship with the customer, creating confidence, building trust, letting them get to know, like, and trust you. And then, to my opinion, that always starts the first interaction they have with you guys, right? Like that phone call, and that's why I love the automation piece of a sales process, but you lose the human touch, right? I yep. see people are like, oh yeah, like it's great. Like they submit an estimate on our website and it goes to our Calendly link and they get an automated email and I don't even have to talk to them before I show up. And I'm like, I don't think you're getting the concept here, right? Like I love the automation, <laughs> but we need the human connection still, right? 
Um, and it's because of building that relationship, asking those questions. And so, Shane, I think the only other one we really ever hit on, aside from like, what is the scope of work, is yeah. what is your timeline, right? Um, because, you know, uh, this just happened. We're, we're finishing our basement. I called the local door supplier where the builder got the rest of our doors. And, and I'm like, hey, what's your guys lead time? And he's like, six to eight weeks. And I'm like, I need him in three to four. Like, you know, and so just having that upfront conversation with them and, and he was like, well, we might be able to make it work. And, you know, and that's kind of the conversation. But if you're booking six to eight weeks out and somebody needs it done next week, like don't even waste your time with an estimate, right? right. Like unless there's really an opportunity, you can move something around and serve that person, um, you know, just get that out of the way on the phone. So that's the only other thing we really used to hit on. For sure. That's good. Speaking of that, um, Cha asked, do you have any scripts on how to deliver your estimates? What is your closing rate? What have you done to increase your closing rate with your estimates? So I think, I mean, we've got some different stuff internally put together for some of our clients. Um, we don't really have like a dialogue and a script necessarily for some of that, but I think it's really just, you know, we tried to always present estimates on the spot. We talked about that in the pre-recording. Um, and so for us, it was just, hey, we just want to run through this bid with you, top to bottom, go through yeah. everything because we want to communicate the value you're getting because I knew we weren't the cheapest, just like Shane just said that they aren't either, right? And so I need you to understand why this project is actually $7,000 or whatever the number is when you might only be expecting five. Um, and here's what you're getting for your money. Here's everything we're doing. Here's the products we're using with Sherwin. Here's everything you're getting for this price, right? And so, I mean, I always say one of the biggest things was we get down to the price and it was, hey, all paint labor materials, it's $69.95. And then see what their reaction is, right? Let them dictate the next step. Don't talk your way into a sale and right out of the sale, right? <laughs> so, um, but I mean, there's really no like tactics or anything. I mean, we typically closed about our, our historical average was 75%, which is a little bit high um, for the industry. But um, we had a lot of repeat business, a lot of referrals, a lot of word of mouth. And I think that that plays into the closing rates is how you're getting your leads, right? Um, so when you're getting a lot of really good and warm leads that already know, like, and trust us, it's easier to sell those jobs. So speaking of that, we have a, a future episode as well about ratings, reviews, and word of mouth. So lots of great content Perfect. coming your way. Um, Shane, do you have any any tips on that? Or we probably have time for like one or two more questions. No, I'm just super quick. I think Chris hit on it. I mean, I don't, we don't have a script necessarily. We have some scripts on the admin side for intake um, when she gets a call. But, um, you know, really when you're delivering it, it's just be confident in, in your company and what you can provide. Be confident in, you know, what you're able to do for them and how you meet their needs. I would say that's that's just a big thing. It's like you want to meet the need they have, right? Like you're delivering something that will meet a need they have. That's your posture the whole way through. Um, not like, oh, I'm doing you a favor by showing up, but it's but I really you have a need and I, we want to meet that. And here's how we can do that. And here's how we can take care of you through the process. Here's how you can have a good experience. You know, most people can produce a good, a good, a decent, at least a decent paint job, if not a good one. Right. Like um, that's just not that that's a pretty low bar. So how do we create a great experience for the customer and how do you sell them on that taking place is a, is a big part of it, I think so. I think one thing I'll piggyback on real quick is I think if you have an entire sales script, it's it's obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're genuine and just running through the bid with them and everything you just talked about, it's a little bit more natural. Um, I will say there's two things that we had like scripts for and they were like one liners. Um, and the first one was um, whenever I would call people back or follow up from an estimate, I would always ask, do you have any questions? Like, I know, no brainer, really complicated here, right? But it just got so repetitive and natural for me that that would then always dictate again the conversation and the direction. Hey, no, we're waiting on other bids or we're still thinking about it. Or yes, we did have a question. And then my closing line, and this is a super, super slick closing line. Um, it was, do you want to get scheduled in? Like that was my ask for the sale, right? Hey, do you want to get scheduled in? It's non-threatening. It's not pushy. It's not aggressive. But hey, here's what the next step is. Do you want to get scheduled in? Right. So those are the only two like script things that I really ever used. And just because it just was easy for that to just come out naturally um, when it was the right time for it. The great tip. Um, Julie, do you want to handle the last question while I attempt to bring up our slides one more time for a couple more resources? Absolutely. So there's a couple that came through, but um, I'll start with Luke. Um, some customers have been hesitant to pay a deposit. Is that something you've successfully dealt with and how? Shane, go for it. I, I, I mean, I, 
Yeah, it depends on the amount of the deposit. Right? I think, I mean, I think Chris, you know more about, I think 20% is roughly an average. I think when you get above that, they get a little iffy, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't most know. Of our, most of our clients do 20 or 25% for deposit. Um, you know, there's going to be a, a couple random times throughout the year that somebody's going to be really hesitant about it. And then I think you just kind of work with it as best as you can, right? Or even say, hey, can we just at least take a $50 scheduling deposit? And, you know, just we need something, right? Um, I tried never to cause an issue about it because obviously I understand some people have gotten burned by contractors. Like, so I understand from like an empathy and customer, like homeowner perspective. Uh, but at the end of the day, like we're running a business too, right? So I think it's just that happy medium in there. Um, I think if you're asking for 50%, um, that could, you know, maybe scare some people away in certain things. I understand that. Um, so 20 to 25%, 98% of people aren't going to have an issue with it. You're going to have a random one or two, try to get a 50 or hundred dollar deposit, just a scheduling, you know, fee or something just to try to work with them. Um, you know, or if you really think that they're going to follow through and, and move forward with it, because for me, it's all about them canceling on you, the scheduling. It's not about them not paying at the end. It's about the commitment to actually going forward. Right. Again, we mentioned great tools and Sharon Williams does have our Pro Plus app, which you can use, open up the camera on your phone and scan the QR codes to download it and take advantage of our value added project bid tool um, that's within the app. Um, as I mentioned, Chris also has a great tool that he's offering to, for everybody. It's linked at the top of the show notes um, in the chat. And Chris, do you want to give a quick overview of what you're providing to our listeners just because you're a, a great yeah. guy who wants to help out other painters? Absolutely. No, I'm always happy to. Um, you know, so really what that is, is it's, it's we call it the estimating number sheet. Um, and it's really your way to take your numbers at your estimate that will kind of calculate your price for you as you go. So if you put in your hourly rate, you put in what your paint cost is per gallon, um, you can actually, if you do it on the hourly method, and this can all obviously be customized specifically to you and your business and your estimating practices, this is just kind of a general template. Um, you know, you can basically just put in hours for each task on each side of the house or each room in the house that it's interior. Um, and it'll calculate everything together for you. So by the time you get done walking through getting your numbers, your price is basically built for you. Awesome. We love that automation. Hey, Chris, where can people find you if they want to pick your brain on some more stuff? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're at Elite Business Advisors um, on all those platforms. Uh, you can also go to our website, www.elitebusinessadvisors.com. Um, and you can schedule a free business analysis meeting with us or just reach out with a question. Um, email is the same, chris at elitebusinessadvisors.com. Thank you both so much, Shane and Chris, for joining us today and sharing all of your information. I think we might need to have a 2.0 here. Um, and thank you every for everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, Julie mentioned we do have our next topic for August's uh, Pro Plus Business Training webinar. It's going to be all about recruiting and building culture. It's a conversation you don't want to miss. Um, speaking of never missing anything, um, please sign up to receive our text alerts. You can either, again, um, open up the camera on your phone and scan the QR code, and you will get notified of upcoming episodes when they post to YouTube. You'll also get a 10 off 50, so that's another great reason to sign up. Um, we've got some instructions there about if you don't want to use your QR code, you can um, text your zip code to 72468 and then reply yes for the US and so on and so forth. So um, thanks again, everyone, for being here. We're super excited about this new series. Thank you for hanging with us through a few technical difficulties. And you can also watch our episode from last month all about Marketing 101. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.